Now that we've worked through different elements of the sample size formula and illustrated some of the basic applications, let's circle back to the initial prerequisites that we had to have to conduct an optimal sample size calculation and see if we can begin to really appreciate how important each one of those prerequisites is. Consider the following. Our population of interest is 21-year-old adults or older who drink alcoholic beverages at least occasionally. A simple random sample was collected through an online panel provider. And here's the following survey question. It's a Likert scaled uh, question. It says, in most situations, I prefer craft beer over any other alcoholic beverages. At first blush, it looks like we're ready to conduct an optimal sample size calculation, but that's not true. We have yet to specify exactly how we intend to analyze this actual question. And there's two possibilities that are very common in marketing research. Possibility A, we might want to report the average score to this question. This is typically on a one to five scale. We simply want to estimate the average score that people respond to and project that to the overall population. But a second possibility is equally as likely. Instead of reporting an average, I may simply want to report the percentage of individuals who either agreed or strongly agreed. In other words, group those top two scores together and report the percentage. This is very common in marketing scale reporting. So famous, in fact, it's called something that we commonly hear, two box scores, where you take the two highest scores, group them and calculate a percentage, and then push all the rest into a different percentage group. These two different possibilities guide us towards entirely different statistical evaluation. Each one of these will result in us approaching the optimal sample size formula calculation entirely different. Now, if I want to report the average score to this question, first, I have to use the proper optimal sample size formula, and then I have to, wherever that average score actually is, I have to determine an appropriate margin of error, confidence interval, and variance in the population. I decided to set my desired confidence level at 95% following convention. I set the margin of error at 0.1 points on the five point scale you see above. That little green bar there represents that small margin of error. The variance in the population, I use the take the range and divide by four rule of thumb, getting a variance in the population of one. And plugging all those numbers into the equation results in me requiring a sample size of 385 respondents. Now, if I go with possibility B, where I want to report the percentage of who agree or strongly agree, a two box score, I have to use the appropriate equation, a different one. And I have to again consider how to estimate my confidence level, margin of error, and variance in the population, but I have to follow slightly different conventions. I can again set my desired confidence level at 95% following standard convention, but now my margin of error is of course in percentage points since I'm calculating a percentage. And I decided to set it at four percentage points. For variance in the population, I follow a different rule of thumb. I decided to use the 0.5 times 0.5 or 50-50 rule of thumb, the play it safe, and that results in a variance in the population estimate of 0.25. And plugging all of these values into this equation results in an optimal sample size requirement of 600. Now, I'm not saying that one approach is better than the other just because the optimal sample size calculation is different, but rather I'm illustrating here that you have to know your analysis plan of a variable before you can actually determine what the right sample size is. So what's the moral of the story? You literally cannot determine your optimal sample size until you have your study fully designed and your analysis plan determined. Now that we have some familiarity with each component of the sample size formula, how we derive the values we use or estimate those values, let's understand how if we hold the other parts of the equation constant, how tweaking each individual component of the sample size formula will impact overall optimal sample size calculations. This is true for both of the two equations we deal with. First, as you increase the confidence percentage that you require for your optimal sample size, by increasing confidence, it's going to increase the required sample size. To be more sure, you're going to have to pay for it with more data collection. If you decrease your margin of error, meaning you want less error in your estimates, again, you're going to have to pay for it with increasing your required sample size. Finally, as the estimated variance in the population becomes larger, meaning that the values are more dispersed away from an average, a natural consequence is that it's going to require us to gather more data 
to estimate our optimal sample size. Now keep in mind, confidence percentage and margin of error are the only two levers in this equation that you get to control. Variance in the population is not something that we get to tweak just because it makes us happier that we don't have to collect as much data. Our goal is always to estimate that value correctly. But the other two are up to us and they have to fit with the level of precision or resource constraints that we have to deal with when, con when conducting marketing research. Although we've learned the basics of setting up and applying the optimal sample size formula for marketing research studies, we still have a problem. How do we determine exactly how many individuals we need to contact in our sampling frame to actually achieve our optimal sample size? We already know that not every single person we contact is going to result in a complete valid response. We might have some bad contact information. Someone might just simply not respond to our survey offer. We might reach them, but they simply actively refuse to participate. They may try to take the study, but it turns out they don't actually qualify. Or they may start the survey and then simply drop out. Or they may provide answers that, when upon inspection, we realize renders an invalid survey response. So what do we do? The solution here is we use a thing called the total sampling elements equation to estimate how many respondents we're likely to have to contact in order to reach our valid sample size. This is the basic setup of the total sampling elements equation. Notice that in the previous videos, we've already determined this. That's the valid sample size that we need to have in our final complete data set. The total sampling elements equation is used to figure out how many people we have to contact to get to that number. We'll use some Excel spreadsheet exercises, if you're in my class, to understand exactly how this particular formula functions. You may have noticed in the two equations that we used in these video series, we didn't worry about the total size of the population that we were drawing our sample from. Shouldn't that matter? Actually, it turns out it's not that big of a deal. Take a look at the bottom part of this table here. Notice that for the exact same level of 95% confidence in a margin of error of 5%, two and a half or one, whether the population is half a million people or 1 million people, the actual sample size that we'll have to collect is exactly the same or nearly exactly the same. It turns out once the population of interest is some arbitrarily large number, even larger than we observe in this table, we can simply ignore estimating or using the size of the population when calculating the required sample size, like we did in the examples in these slides. In reality, we're just playing it safe. By assuming an infinite and arbitrarily large population, at worst, we're just going to do optimal sample size calculations that result in us having a slightly larger sample than would have been required had we done a more convoluted optimal sample size calculation with the entire population size. With that said, it's really not a big deal to incorporate that population information, but the equations change. Simply Google finite population calculation correction for sample sizes, and you'll see how to adapt these equations with relative ease. As we're wrapping up our conversation about sample size calculation, I should point out sample size calculations only allow us to assess one type of uncertainty and error in our calculations specifically sampling error. But look at the language that's used by some of the most famous and gold standard polling companies in the United States. GFK notes, sampling error is just one source of potential error in surveys. Errors can arise from question wording, the order in which questions are asked, low response rates, or non-response by subjects being contacted, and other potential sources. These are all issues that we've spoken about in other uh, content during this course. Similarly, Pew Research notes, in addition to sampling error, one should bear in mind that question wording and practical difficulties in conducting surveys can induce error or bias into the findings of opinion polls. In the Harris poll notes, all sample surveys and polls, whether or not they use probability sampling, are subject to multiple sources of error, which are most often not possible to quantify or estimate. These perspectives render a very interesting uh, observation we have to consider. 
are we maybe misleading individuals when we report the results of survey or experimental analysis where we're studying individuals and we report those margin of errors and confidence when in fact those margins of error and confidence assume that there is absolutely no other source of error in our analysis. The difficulties associated with conducting unbiased, objective research when we're studying humans is very profound. We're almost certainly underestimating some of our error when we only report sampling error. I don't have a great answer to this question. I can tell you that in common practice, we still report margin of error in our statistical confidence estimates, but there's a stronger push to be clear that we can't account for all sources of error.